uh, I have a new announcement to make. Well, uh, first, today's discussion will assume that you have watched up to lesson four from announcement four. Uh, on Tuesday next week, on Tuesday next week, then by then you should have watched less, up to lesson five. Uh, and don't forget that this Saturday you have quiz one due. Let me see how many people have turned it in. Yeah, so far only nine people turned it in. Out of supposedly around 60 something. Now, uh, quiz one assumes you uh, did lesson one, right? So I wonder why I don't have that many people doing that. It should be something done a lot earlier. Well, anyway, uh, going back to the discussion. Yeah, make sure you turn it in by this Saturday, okay? Saturday, almost midnight, but not midnight, almost midnight. Now, uh, new thing. There will be a slight change in how I will run my discussion forward. Now, this will affect your class just a little bit, okay, in a positive way, okay? And it affects uh, my Monday, Wednesday session a lot more. I'll make sure you read this uh, discussion board in the entirety. Now, basically, this is uh, here's what happens. Uh, I'm currently teaching two sections, right? Uh, my Tuesday, Thursday class starts first because uh, the first day of the first week we have uh, President's Day on Monday, Wednesday. So your class Tuesday, Thursday starts first, and then uh, Monday, Wednesday. So here's what happened. Uh, last week. So last week, this is what happened last week. Uh, on Monday, which was what? Uh, so on February the 15th, we have President's Day. So the Monday, Wednesday class off. Now then on Tuesday, the 16th, uh, Tuesday, Thursday class starts and that was an intro, right? Now, and then Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday class starts last week on 17th. Then I did the same intro. Now, last week for you on Thursday, on the 18th, we did lesson one and two. Because that's meeting number two for you, right? That's lesson one and two. Now, then comes this last Monday, the 22nd. Monday, Wednesday class. Then they ran, they, they ran a discussion on lesson one and two. Is it right? Okay, because that's their second meeting. Okay, and again, uh, your Tuesday, uh, two days ago, we went up to lesson three. So Tuesday, uh, 23rd for Tuesday, Thursday class, we did lesson three. And Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, we did lesson three again. Yeah. Today, we will do lesson four. We do, do problems from the book based on lesson four. Now, here's what happened. Here's what happened. So uh, what happened is this, like uh, 
my Monday, Wednesday, I, I got this idea actually uh, last week, Monday, uh, this previous Monday. This Monday, I was sick. This Monday, I was sick. So what I told them to do is like, what I told them to do, uh, I told them uh, watch recording from Tuesday, Thursday. February the 18th from Tuesday, Thursday class. Okay, after all, uh, I supposed to cover the same thing. Okay, I supposed to cover the same thing. But then I, uh, on that Monday, while I was sick, I was, I hardly, hardly have had, had that kind of uh, hard time. Uh, feeling dizzy and now seer, like I want to throw out on that last Monday. I usually get, when I get sick, usually just dizzy or headache, okay? Uh, because I have a history of, of nose cancer. So uh, just this headache, but uh, that time was like nausea also. My wife told me that maybe it's a food poison uh, because uh, I really want to throw out all the time, right? Um, uh, very likely it's food poison. Now, anyway, so when I was uh, taking my rest, mm -hmm. then I realized one thing, well, hey, you know what? For my, for my Monday, Wednesday class, I can just tell them to watch the recording from the previous days uh, from Tuesday, Thursday class. Okay, so my Tuesday, Thursday class will take the lead. Let me mark it in different color. My Tuesday, Thursday class will take the lead. And my Monday, Wednesday class just watch the recording from the previous day. Right? Okay. And Thomas can just not doing anything on Monday, Wednesday. Just tell them to watch the recording uh, and I will come to class just to sit down if they have any question. But then I get bored. You see, uh, what happened is this. I get bored to repeat the same lesson, especially if they are next to each other. Like I did it yesterday, I need to do it again today, for example. Okay. So yesterday I asked them, uh, instead of do, going over the same material that I already did yesterday. So yesterday, I told them that I did it's the same material I did two days ago. Okay. While if, if that's the case, uh, I myself get a bit bored. Okay. Uh, a risk of deja vu. And also, uh, that's, I don't think that's a good way to spend our time. You know, so I proposed to them to my Monday, Wednesday class, the following. So this is, and, and they uh, basically agree with a little variation. Okay, they basically agree with a little variation uh, that this is what happened. Now for Tuesday, Thursday class will run just like before. So for you, my Tuesday, Thursday class, we will run just like before on, uh, so your Tuesday on, uh, March the second, the Tuesday Thursday class will do discussion based on lesson five in my announcement four. Okay, so nothing really changed with yours. Nothing really changed with yours. Okay, and as always, uh, if you have any question from textbook that I don't co cover or any question from anywhere that you want me to go over, feel free to ask me. Okay, feel free to interrupt me, feel free to ask me. Now, the change is more radical to for them. Uh, for Monday, starting this Monday, March the 1st, the Monday, Wednesday class will not go over uh, problems from the textbook we will go over problems from my old tests. Okay, but still related to the lesson. Okay, all test problems based on te lesson four. Okay, now you know I have my old tests available on my website, right? Okay, so sometimes what happened is this, when I went over the lesson with you, when I do problems from the book, sometimes I kind of rush that I want to also do 
because I also want to do problems from my old test, but I don't really have time. I don't really have time. There are a lot of problems in our textbook that is, however difficult you think it is, it's still standard for me. Okay, my real te my test is the real question that you really need to overcome. Okay, but then if I don't go over problems from my old test, and uh, last fall I have students complain in this back too, saying that oh Thomas your test is so different. It's just like but my old test is already on the website. You you should just study from there. Okay, and of course some people just so ignorant they don't want to do whatever they're supposed to do, but they expect me to do whatever I don't need to do. Okay, now to shut them up so that I don't have that kind of student anymore in this class, uh, both sections, then starting this Monday, I will do problems from my old test. Okay, now how will this affect you? It will not, it will not affect you negatively because your, for your class, your class still run regular way, right? Nothing really changed. But then if you say, uh, Thomas, uh, will you go over problems from your old test? Uh, then I will say, uh, just look at the recording from Monday, Wednesday. You see what I mean? Okay. You can go over, uh, I, you can just look at problems that I already went over on Monday, Wednesday. So let's say, let's say this weekend you want to study, start studying from my old test. Uh, what you can do one way is to watch the recording from my Monday, Wednesday class. Actually, not this weekend, uh, next weekend. Okay, so there, Monday, Wednesday, on March the 3rd, uh, I will go over the all test problems related to lesson five. On their Wednesday, on their Monday, I will go over problems uh, all, prob all uh, problems from old tests based on lesson four for on the Monday. Okay, uh, so could we see the old questions through Monday, Wednesday class rec uh, recording video? Is it right? Yes, yes. The the good thing about I I didn't uh, think about it until much later though, uh, until I was sick on Monday, uh, three days ago, uh, that students your class you can look at monday wednesday class right you can look at monday wednesday recording can you let's take a look let's take a look what i mean is this now you try this yourself just to make sure later on i don't want you to tell me oh, thomas i i don't know how to do it it's like i did i showed it in class okay you definitely have access to your tuesday thursday recording right you go to comfort now and then you go to event recording Okay, so uh, you for sure you have access to Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday. Okay, except the one that today that I have not uh, posted. Okay. Now, the thing is, I want you to confirm to me from your student point of view that you can watch, uh, for example, the recording from February 17th, Wednesday, last week. Can you check? do student view because as I know I wonder if I can do student no I don't I don't I cannot I cannot do student view that's the thing can I can do that yeah, view as student okay and then defend defend recording yeah right this is the student view so you can see what I did with them last Wednesday, okay, last Monday, and then yesterday, right? Can anyone from Tuesday, Thursday class confirm to me through the chat that you can watch it? Try the one yesterday, Wednesday, uh, February the 24th recording. Can you do that? go to here and then you will look at the the streaming 
You said MP4. I think it's yeah, MP4. So this is what I went over with them. Okay, so by the way, Rodrigo, are you from Monday, Wednesday or Tuesday, Thursday? Uh, I'm from Tuesday, Thursday. Okay, so Tuesday, Thursday can access Monday, Wednesday, right? Correct, yes. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so this way then I basically equip this class. Uh, it makes me download the video. Actually, I don't download the video, uh, but thanks for your concern. Uh, no, I don't download the video. I, I will do the recording for them anyway, you know, okay? It just turns out that when I stop the recording, once I stop the recording, then Zoom will process that and post it on your uh, 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 on your canvas. Do you need to download it? I don't think you need to download it though. It's you can just make it streaming. Yeah, you can just make it streaming. So it won't it won't affect your hard drive. Yeah. Okay. It's on our canvas. Yeah. It's on our canvas. Now, of course, I understand some students actually want to download it to their to their uh, computer such that they can watch it at any time they like. They don't need to lock, lock on anymore. Of course, that's one way to do that. Okay, but no, you don't, you actually don't need to download it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you don't need to download it. Uh, I did download before in the past. I actually download it, but that's because I want to upload it to YouTube and there's no way for me to upload it directly from here to YouTube. You know, so I download to my hard, I download to my hard drive first, and then from my hard drive I upload it to YouTube. Once it is up on YouTube, then I delete the one in my hard drive. The recording here I cannot delete it. Okay, the recording here I cannot delete it, and that's a good thing because then it becomes an evidence in case I say something wrong and you say, Thomas, uh, you know what? Uh, I am not happy with the way you say that thing, and that's offensive. Blah blah blah. Uh, really, really bad. Right. Of course, in that case, I uh, I will appreciate you giving my chance to clarify and apologize. But uh, yeah, you can you can use that against me actually the one here. Okay. But uh, you can also some students may be so evil also. No, I'm not saying all. Some students, like if I were a student and I want to be evil to my teacher, I may do this. Like I I download it and I and I edit the video a little bit. <laughs> okay, that's really evil, huh? I edit the video a little bit and sue the professors, right? But the professor also have the original recording, so that's not a, a good way to do it, though. Well, anyway, that's that's just a little talk. Uh, so uh, this way, then, if I go back up, go back to our discussion. If I go back to our discussion, then with that kind of scheme, instead of you having my lecture from the YouTube video that I already posted. Okay, you also, as usual, with the plan that we have so far in place for you, uh, we will have chance to do problems from our textbook, right? Okay, but prior to this plan, we don't have uh, ways to go over problems from my previous tests. Now, starting this Monday, Okay, I will start working on problems that I, we have from our previous tests, and hopefully then uh, we have the complete set. In a sense that you have the lecture, you have uh, problems that we do from the textbook, and we have problems that I do from my old tests. Okay, now the thing is this though, the problem from my old test requires more maturity. Okay, it requires more maturity. So there is a chance you don't want to watch the recording until the weekend after you are sure that you have done some problems from our textbook. Okay. Uh, in other words, if you don't do problems from our textbook and you just go ahead with problems from my previous test, you may get confused and very discouraged, which is not a good idea. Okay. It's like you are not growing yet for that topics. 
and then I force you right away to be mature uh, in pre-calculus for that topic. Uh, that could be discouraging, okay? So, so make sure you go through this phase. You need to go through these three phases in this order. Okay. There's no way for you to like, you know what, Thomas, I think I'm smart enough. Then I will just look at how you do go over your previous test. And then after you, I look at your previous test, I will pick and choose which topic I think I have hard time. Then I will try problems from the textbook. Uh, if I still don't know how to problem from, do problems from the textbook, then I will go back to, to the lecture. Okay, now doing it that way will not help because what? What happened if there are things, ideas from my lecture, okay, which is actually quite foundational. However, you didn't catch that because you skipped the, that topic. Now, in long run, uh, you may have issue, okay, very likely in long run, okay, like for example, what we do, we have done earlier i think from 1.2 or 1.3 we did factoring right it will show up a lot of times okay right now may not be that bad but uh, furthermore it will be okay solving equations right why i need you to do it this way why i need you to do it that way that actually appears in my lectures and then being emphasized again in when i do problems from a textbook but when i go over my previous test i will just go, go over that as if that you already know it so even though you have all these three sets complete, uh, in my opinion, do not, do not skip any one of them. Do it in this order, okay? Now, however, I want you to remember that you can always interrupt me with questions related to the topic of that day. So today we go over lesson number four, right? So if you have question from related to lesson number four, you can always ask me. Okay, I may just say, oh, you know what, let's do it later. Okay, but I will for sure come back to that if uh, we already uh, reached that, uh, that part. Any question? No question. Now, let me go on. I just realized that I don't have lecture recording starting from trigonometry part. I think the second or the third video for trigonometry part, which is approximately after test two. Okay, now then what will I do at that time? What will I do at that time? Now at that time, when I don't have my recording anymore for uh, my trigonometry, the trigonometry part, then Tuesday, Thursday class will have the lecture then Monday, Wednesday class will have the problems from book. Okay. That's approximately after your test too. Uh, so approximately after week number nine, but I will see later on uh, to, to uh, I will need to clarify again uh, which part is that, okay? Now, there's a chance that I remember there's supposed to be one Thursday where our school say there's no day. Now, because of that one day off, there's a chance that your role, Monday and Wednesday role, gets switched at that time. So if that happened, then they will take the lead and you are the one looking at their, uh, that, at their uh, recording. When that happened, I will let you know. Okay, I will let you know. When that happened, I will let you know. Okay, but that's much later for the trigonometry part. That's because I don't have the recording. Trigonometry. Okay. Uh, 1.6 number 31. Okay, later on. Okay, I finish 1.4 first. Okay, I finish 1.4 first, and then when we get to 1.6, uh, you remind me. Okay. Once we get there, I don't even think you may uh, need to ask me that question anymore. Okay, but just remind me. Let me write it here then. Uh, it's uh, number 31. 
Any question about this plan? The what if, what if, what if case. So basically there's no change with you. There's no change with you. But Thomas, then uh, uh, later on for the trigonometry part, then we will not have problems from the book, right? Uh, uh, well, the thing is I don't even have the lecture, right? So my plan before was that because I don't have the lecture video to pro, uh, already recorded, so for my Tuesday Thursday class I will do the lecture. My Monday Wednesday class I will also do the uh, I would also do the lecture. That's the original plan. But then because of this change, then uh, you still will have the lecture according to the original plan. Monday Wednesday will follow your lead, but then they will have problems from the book, which you can watch from theirs. Okay, so today, for example, I have lecture on basic trigonometry, then tomorrow I do problems from basic trigonometry. After they are done with their class, then you can watch their recording. Okay. Uh, I hope that's all. But again, if you have any question, uh, let me know. Uh, don't forget that this weekend, this Saturday, you will have quiz one do and most of you not doing it yet. That's something so you're supposed to do that during the weekend though. I mean, that's something uh, already done. It's based on lesson one only, based on lesson one only, okay? Uh, midpoint, equation of a line, equation of a circle, even though I don't cover that from with problems from the book, but that's so basic, that's basically review from your algebra too. Okay, let me go back to 1.4. That's the start of the discussion with problems from our textbook. Uh, from 1.4, yesterday we have, uh, no, on two days ago, we already did, we already did linear equation. Uh, we already did uh, quadratic equation. We already did a uh, rational equation. And today we will do, so this quadratic equation we have uh, solving by factoring. Professor? Yes. When is no. Ah, oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we do by factoring uh, on 1.4. And then, so earlier I keep on talking about these. Yeah, earlier I keep on talking about this and then my screen is wrong. Well, anyway, oh, uh, well, yeah. Next time, please let me know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So on Tuesday, we did linear equation, quadratic equation, linear, uh, linear equation, and there could be some combo among them, right? Like for example, actually one of the question, couple of the question we had was actually linear equation, but was uh, hidden in rational equation. So we did rational equation when we multiplied by the LCD and simplify turned out to be just a linear equation. So we did this first and after simplifying, it turns out to be just linear equation, right? Okay, so uh, do not think that these are different cases. No, that can be, it become combo. It become combo, okay? Uh, when we have a rational equation, uh, I think that's number 13. Yeah, when we did number 13, original rational equation, it turns out to be quadratic equation that we solve by factory, okay? And we have quadratic equation that we solve by completing the square. And solving quadratic equation by uh, quadratic formula. Okay, now factoring, not always work, not always work. Now completing the square and quadratic formula always work. But do not use, but do not use 
if solvable by factoring. Okay. Now, complete the square method will work best if, of course, first not factorable. Second, the leading coefficient is one, coefficient of the variable x is even. Okay, so quadratic formula, basically our last option. Is this, t is the teacher screen available? Hold on, what are you watching, looking? I'm sorry. What do you mean by the teacher screen? Teacher screen. Okay, this is what we learned on Tuesday. Okay, can you see that now, Cry? Okay, good. Uh -huh. Now then, today we will continue with, uh, I will do the easier one first, uh, quadratic-like equation. And then radical equation. And then, oh, you know what? We did a little bit of absolute value also, absolute value equation. Now, then after I'm done with radical equation, I will go back to do absolute value equation, the one not in our book. Okay, now then from there we go to 1.6. I think uh, by the end of today, hopefully we have a chance to do problems I know that I won't be able to finish 1.6, but I should be able to do the problem that one of our friends asked. Okay, now let's see, quadratic-like equation. Quadratic-like equation is or are equations that is not quadratic, but can be seen as quadratic equation, not quadratic. but can be solved in or seen in quadratic form. Okay, now for example, for example, I picked question number, I did number 42, I believe in our uh, no. lesson. Let me do number 41. Mm. Number 41, we have three X to the power of two thirds plus four X to the power of one third minus four equals zero. Now, this is definitely not quadratic equation. However, uh, we can see that as quadratic equation based on the following observation. Notice that it consists of three terms, okay? And the variable part here, the variable part here is the square of the variable part of the other term. And the last term, the remaining term is constant. Okay. So in other words, you see that x to the one third, if you square it, that's x to the two thirds, right? Now, if you see equations like that, like three terms, okay, one of them constant, the other two have variables where one of the variable is the square of the other variable, then 
we can approach that problem by quadratic like equation approach that is uh, we do this substitution let x u let u equals to x to the one third yeah, consequently then u squared equals to x to the two thirds right can you follow me now what i will do then i will solve for that x to the one third first something i call u after I'm done with x to the one third, then I attack the x itself. So I'm not attacking x directly right now. Okay. I am attacking x to the one third as the door into that x. Okay. Now, if I do that substitution, if I do that substitution, then the equation now becomes 3u squared plus 4u minus 4 equals zero. Now you see, oh, this is quadratic equation. Can I factor it, right? If you can solve it by factoring, then you should. Again, if you can solve it by factoring, then you should. Now then u1 equals to two thirds u2 equals to negative 2. But we are not done yet. We are not done yet. We are not done yet. Uh, I need to solve for x, not solve for u. So I put that x back. u is x to the one third. Is it right? u is x to the one third. So then how to solve for x? Now notice that x to the one third is the same to cube root of x. You right? So to have your x, what do we do? We cube both sides. Now that will give us the other side to be Two thirds squared, I'm sorry, cube, which is eight over twenty-seven. Now, likewise, for the second branch, cube root of x is negative two, so x is negative two cube, which is negative eight. Okay, now how do we know again, how do we know that uh, an equation, even though it's not quadratic, can be solved using this method? Okay, it consists of three terms. So that it, it's trinomial, right? Remember, we want to call that quadratic like, and quadratic equation has this form, ax squared plus dx plus c equals to zero. To be considered as quadratic form, then it should be three terms, right? One of them constant, one of them constant, and uh, this guy here, the variable part for one of the term is the square of the variable part of the other term. If you see this phenomena, then you know you can approach that using quadratic like equation. Therefore, we do substitution first. We do substitution first so that we can rewrite that as quadratic equation solve that quadratic equation, then substitute back. That's the plan. Okay, that's the plan. <clears throat> now, let's see another problems from another problem from our textbook, something that uh, one of your friends asked me on Tuesday, I believe, number 37. Yeah, I have planned to, when go, to go over this anyway. So we have 5y to the fourth minus 7. You know what? Let me not do this one for now. Let me do number 39 first. 37 is a lot harder. At least a lot tedious. Number 39 is easier. Number 39... 36 
x to the negative 4 minus 13x to the negative 2 plus 1 equals to 0. Now, it consists of three terms, one of them constant. Okay, and then this term, this variable part here is the square of this one. So I can do substitution, let u equals to x to the negative two. Consequently, then u squared will be x to the negative four, right? Now, then our equation now becomes 36 u squared minus 13 u plus one equals to zero. Then try to solve by factoring. I think this is factorable. Uh, what times what is one? So the sign should be negative, negative here. Right? This is both ones. What times what is 36, but the sum is 13. Nine and four, nine u and four u. <clears throat> so u one is one ninth u2 is 1, 4. So I already solved that quadratic equation in u. I put it back in terms of x. So x to the negative 2 is 1 over 9. Oh, but x to the negative 2 is 1 over x squared. Right? If 1 over x squared is 1 9, then x squared must be just flip that upside down, right? The x squared must be nine. Therefore, x one two will be plus minus square root of nine, which is plus and minus three. Do the same pattern here. So x squared equals to four, x three four is plus minus square root of four, which is plus two or just two and negative two. Okay, so if you see my approach, it consists of this stage. I do substitution such that it becomes quadratic. I do substitution becomes quadratic. Then I solve it as quadratic. Then substitute back. Okay, those are the stages. So you can... Yes, uh huh? Somebody say something earlier? No. Now, by the way, this number 39 can be done using a method totally different, totally different method. Number 39, redone. Totally different method, at least at the beginning. Uh, let me rewrite the question, 36x to the negative four minus 13 x to the negative two plus one equals to zero. Uh, when you take the test, of course, then the topic may not be that clear for you. That's where your intuition come into play. Uh, you may see this as, oh, you know what? This is 36 over x to the four minus 13 over x squared plus one equals to zero. Okay, and then, oh, that's rational equation. Uh, let me multiply by the LCD, which is x to the four. So is it okay to do it this way, Thomas? Yes, of course, that's okay. It's okay. All I need is like you show me the argument, the valid argument that you do it that way. Okay. Now then, and usually that's what we did anyway, if I have rational equations, so I multiply by the LCD. And uh, I don't get used to have ascending order. Let me reorder them, rewrite them in descending order. 
now you see, oh, now I have a polynomial, degree of four, uh, and we don't know how to solve polynomial degree of four until you realize, oh, you know what? This guy is the square of these. So you may say, oh, you know what? Let me use, for example, t equals to x squared. It doesn't have to be u. For a substitution, t is also okay. That's quite common notation for substitution. Then that polynomial equation becomes t squared minus 13t plus 36 equals zero. Then I will solve for t. The bomb, the boom. x1 equal to 3, x2 is negative 3, x3 equals to 2, x4 equals to negative 2. Okay. So we can do it another way, but in principle, both of this question, uh, both of this approach, right? Even though the second one, I see that as rational equation, but I still need to use this tool uh, quadratic like equation. So learn when you do math, learn the principle instead of categorizing that as, as, oh, this is linear equation. Oh, this is quadratic equation. And this is rational equation. And as if they have no relation between them. No, no, they have, they are related. Okay, they are related. Okay. Now let me attack number 37 then. In my opinion, number 37 is the hardest question uh, for this whole section actually. <clears throat> to be more precise, tedious, <clears throat> tedious. Okay, number uh, 37, five y to the four minus seven y squared plus 1.5 equals to zero. Notice that this guy here is the square of that and the other term is a constant. So I can use substitution let uh, u equals to y squared. So u squared is y to the fourth, right? So I get five u squared minus seven u plus 1.5 equals to zero. <clears throat> I don't think this is factorable. How do I know if an quadra a quadratic equation is factorable? It is factorable if the discriminant is a square number. The discriminant b squared minus 4ac is a square number. So let's do a little check here. D equals to negative B squared, I'm sorry, not negative B squared minus four A C. That is 49 minus 30, that's 19, which is not a square number. Therefore, from there we know that this equation, this quadratic equation is not factorable. In other words, if you compute the discriminant and it turns out to be a square number, then stop there, okay? Try to factor it instead, okay? Now, if the discriminant is not a square number, then continue, okay? So I continue here, then the discriminant is B squared minus four AC. That is equal to 19, which is not a square number. So my U12 is negative b plus minus square root of discriminant over 2a.
Remember I told you in the past that I always want you to split them. Right, I always want you to split them. I hope you see the reason now why I want you to split them. Now U1 is seven plus square root of 19 over 20. Notice that that's a positive number. Is it two times five? That's right, uh -huh. that's two times five. So it should be 10 here. Okay, uh, and U2, seven minus square root of 19 over 10. This is also a positive number, but how do we know that's a positive number, Thomas? The issue is which is greater, seven or square root of 19? Which is greater? Now, the way we see that, uh, what is seven in square root form? Square root of 49, right? Okay. Now, square root of 49 is, of course, greater than square root of 19. Therefore, 7 minus square root of 19 is positive. Is it okay? <clears throat> so it cannot be negative, Thomas. No, 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 no. It's not about that. It's about the following step. Notice that u is y squared, right? u is y squared. So when I substitute this back to y squared, Notice that if y squared equals to a negative number, then there's no real solution. If this were, if this were less than zero, then I can just stop there and say no real solution for the y, right? Okay, but this is positive. In other words, because it's positive, then it must have two roots. Okay, so y one two will be plus minus square root of seven plus square root of 19 over 10. Okay, which we will sim simplify after this, which we will simplify after this. How do I simplify that? Well, I complete the square on the denominator. I multiply the bottom and the top by 10 further, right? Such that the bottom becomes square root of 100, which is 110. On the top, I get square root of 70 plus 10 square root of 19, big over square root of 100, which is now 10. Uh, by the way, when you come into my class, please turn off, please mute it unless you have question. Because if I see other noise like uh, from students, I keep on thinking that, oh, any question, any question, and then uh, my line of thought just disappear. You know, okay. That usually happen if this though, like maybe you already in my, uh, already listened to me for a while, and then you do something with your computer, right? When you do something with you with your computer, there are times that uh, your other software in the computer interfere with Canvas or with the Zoom, such that you don't realize that you do something on that page, but what you did there, actually I can listen, we can listen. Okay, and uh, trust me, if I can hear that, everybody else can hear that. Okay. No, that's okay. You are not the only one. Uh, no, you are not the, the only one. Actually, there have been at least five times, five incidents actually today. You know, and this is the first time I said it out. So Y1 will be, I don't mind though if you have questions. So if you have question, please interrupt me. And because of that, I'm my sense of awareness of, stu uh, of students having question uh, still remain high then once I hear that, I thought you have question. Okay, so if you have question, yes, that's what you I want you to do, interrupt me. Okay, and it starts with that kind of uh, white noise, I call that. Say so that's like that, you know? Okay, now this is the first pair of solutions. Coming from the first U, 
we still have the second U. Okay, but you will see the second U is done pretty much the same way. So y squared equals to seven minus square root of 19 over 10. Once we realize that's positive, then we know we have to go on. Y three, four is plus minus square root of seven minus square root of 19 over 10. Rationalize the denominator, multiply the top and the bottom by 10 inside the square root. So y three, four becomes plus minus square root of 70 minus 10 square root of 19 over 10. Now then I will split it. Okay, so that's for quadratic like equation. How about radical equation? Those are equations involving radical, either square root or cube root. Okay, now we have this though, idea. Square root of blah equals to constant to get rid of that square root so that we have only blah, we square both sides. Square both sides. So the way to get rid of radical, we square both sides such that blah equals to c squared. However, every time when you solve equation, you have this step where you square both sides, then we may have, we may get some extraneous solution. That is solutions that satisfy this, but not that. Okay, remember this principle though. Every time you solve an equation by squaring both sides, then you may have extra new solutions. That is the solution to the after you square both sides, but not the original in equa uh, in, uh, original equation. So to overcome to get rid of that extraneous solution, uh, we need to check. Against original equation. Okay, we need to check original equation. Okay, now uh, let me give you an example why we need to check. Uh, it's usually because the other side is negative, okay? It's usually because the other side is negative. Okay, maybe I give you the idea first uh, how to do this. Example one, if I have square root of x equals to three, that's a positive number, right? So I will square both sides. So x equals to three squared, that is nine. Then we're supposed to check. Square root of nine is it equals to three. And that's true. So x equals to nine. <clears throat> now what happened if I change that three becomes negative three? Square root of x equals to negative three, which if you think about it, it's impossible. Square root of x will always be zero or positive, cannot be negative. So actually at this point, you can already say no real solution. Okay, but if just in case we don't know, right? We just, uh, I want to follow standard procedure, then I square both sides. 
the square both sides. So x equals to 9 millisecond. Therefore, I check square root of 9 is it equals to negative 3. Remember, I check against the original equation. Okay, and then don't square both sides anymore. No, no, you, you simplify the left hand side, is it equal to the right hand side? Okay, and when I do so, I found out that left hand side is three, right hand side is not three. Okay. Because we have only one candidate for that question, one candidate solution for that question, and that one candidate doesn't work. So we will say, so no solution. Some notes for my class. In my class, in my class, if C is positive, then square root of X equals to C implies X equals to C squared, and you don't need to check. You can always check. Okay, you can always check, never wrong, but you, I don't require you to check anymore. You don't need to check as long as the right hand side is positive. Okay, positive constant. Now, on the other hand, if the right hand side is negative, then square root of X equals to C implies, you don't need to square it. You can just cut it short right away, say no solution. Okay, in fact, this is also true if the other side equals to zero. Okay, in other words, in other words, if you are in my class and you get question like at example 1A, you can just stop here. You can stop here. You don't need to check that anymore because the other side is already positive. Okay, now, but if you have question like example 1B, you can just stop here and just jump right away to no solution. Is it okay? This is the basic one though. I'm, this is uh, what I taught my algebra one student, not even my algebra two. This is my algebra one. Something you saw like at least one year ago. Okay, at least one year ago. Maybe even more. Okay. This is so basic. So uh, the reason I say this because I want to save you some time for unnecessary work, but which is very, very clear. Okay, now, but don't worry, I don't ask this kind of question. <coughs> we don't do this kind of question. We do question like, for example, uh, let's see, let's see number 33 first then, number 33. Number 33 square root of seven minus five x equals to eight, which is a positive number. So after I square both sides, I don't need to check that because uh, it must be true. Okay, seven minus 64 equals to five x. So that's negative 57 equals to five x. So negative 57 over five equals to x and i don't need to check because the other side already positive when do we need to check thomas uh, for example number 35 x equals to 3 plus square root of 5x minus 9 I subtract by three both sides, I get x minus three equals to square root of five x minus nine. Now, to get rid of that radical, I will square both sides. If you ever have a question, should I check at the end or not, Thomas? If you don't know, should you check or not? Just check it, okay? Never wrong to check it, okay? 
Now, in this situation, do we need to check it? Now, the thing is, do you know if the left-hand side is positive or negative? We don't know because it has variable, right? It has variable, so we don't know if that's positive or negative. Now, so for us to go uh, uh, later on, whatever answer we get, we need to check. Because we don't know if the other side is positive or negative. Notice that earlier I said, if it is positive, you don't need to check. If it is negative, don't even go further. So either way, you don't need to check actually, right? Okay, but that's if the other side is constant. What if the other side has variable? The others, what if the other side has variable? Then because it has variable, then we don't know if that will be positive or negative, right? That's the time we need to check later on. I foil this x squared minus 6x plus 9 equals to 5x minus 9. Okay, so x squared minus 11x plus 18 equals to 0. That's x minus 9, x minus 2 equals to 0. Then you need to check. What happened when x equals to 9? So x1 is 9, x2 is 2. You plug that in, is 9 equals to, so when you're checking, you need to put that question mark on the top of your equal sign. 3 plus square root of 5 times 9 minus 9. Remember, I warned you not to use PhotoMath or Microsoft uh, Solver. Okay, and I think I never mentioned Microsoft Solver, uh, but those softwares that enable you to solve math equation without you knowing it cannot follow the procedure correctly. For some strange reason, for example, PhotoMath. They, when they show you the steps, they cannot really make the equal sign straight. That's one. Maybe for, for sometimes they equal uh, that straight, but not all the time. Second, the way they show the, uh, the checking is not really a standard way the way I show you. The way I show you here is the standard way of showing, uh, showing uh, of checking. And the reason they cannot do that because they don't have this notation. They don't have this notation when you are checking. They always put the question mark at the end. But that's not proper though. That's not proper. Because what we are doing right now, we are checking if it is if they are equal. Okay, so the question mark is on the equal side. Okay, I hope that reminds you further. No, you cannot cheat your way to uh, passive trust. At least, at least this, like think this way. Uh, I don't consider myself lost anything if you cheat to pass the class. Okay, I can be uh, I can be just a salary teacher. Okay, in other words, in other words, all I care do I get my paycheck. Okay, so if you pass your class this way or that way, you don't pass your class, none of my problem. I can be just like that. Okay, I'm more than that though. I am more than that. I want you to pass correctly appropriately such that you survive the next class. But once you pass this class without the qualification, without the foundation necessary, then you basically already disabled yourself forever from being successful in, in calculus classes. Why? Because once you pass this class, whatever happened in your calculus class, you cannot come back and retake this class. That's California law. Okay. You may be able to audit it, but uh, I think to audit the class, you still need to pay as if you are taking the class. And no financial aid will not allow you, will not pay for it. Okay. So now, nah, you know what, if I were you, just do it right first time. Okay, so this is 3 plus square root of 36. That's 9. Is it equals to 3 plus 6? Oh, so yeah, that's right. So x equals to 9 is a solution. How about x equals to 2? 
So 2 is it equals to 3 plus square root of 5 times 2 minus 9. 2 is it equals to 3 plus square root of 1. That's not true. Then you summarize, so x equals to 9. Okay, don't, don't just do this, don't just do this. And then, oh, you know what, I got this. And then I visually check that, Thomas, I get this one and not this one. Okay, okay. Because when it needs, when you need to check, I will want you to check and there will be two points there. Okay. If all I need you to give me are final answers, if I don't care about your work, I will not give you a space that is like 20 centimeters long. Okay, I will just give you like one inch space because all I want is the final answer. But no, that's not what I want. I want the work, okay, leading to the final answer, including why you accept this answer and reject this one. Okay. Uh, square root of one is not negative one. Square root of one is not negative one. Let me say it again. Let me erase this first. X squared equals to one implies X is plus minus square root of one. Why? Because square root of one itself means just one. Okay, if square root of one can be plus minus, then I don't need to write that plus minus here. Right? I don't need to write that plus minus here. I don't need to write the plus minus here. You see what I mean? I can just write it this way and then plus minus one like this, but that's not true. The definition of square root is the principal branch. So it will only give you the positive result or zero, but never negative. Does this make sense? If square root of one can be negative one, then there must be a solution to this question. But we know that's not true, right? Yeah, it's about the term, the term principal branch. I agree with you. Actually, I have to say that uh, in the past, I have that misunderstanding also. And my instructor emphasized that to me that no, when it comes to square root, it's the principal branch. Just like this though, just like this one. Okay, just like this one. Uh, X cubed equals to eight. What will X be? What will X be? Uh, that will be two, right? Agree? Now, the thing is, as we will see far in chapter three or maybe chapter four, if you have a polynomial of degree three, you're supposed to have three solutions. You're supposed to have three solutions. Why you have only one here? Where are the other two solutions? They are complex numbers, okay? But the thing is, when we solve this, when we solve this, we say x equals to cube root of eight. Now this cube root of eight refers to the principal branch, which means just the real part. Okay, not the, not the radical part. Okay, unless we specifically say we want to also cover complex numbers, which is beyond the scope, the scope of this uh, course though. Okay, uh, if but but at West LA College we actually cover that we at West LA College we have a trigonometric course in which we purposely solve one of the part is actually solve that kind of equation. Okay, so again, when do we need to check our work? When the other side has variable, therefore it is unknown if it is positive or negative, okay? If the other side is positive, just square it, 
you don't need to check anymore. If the other side is negative, then no, it won't happen. The square root will always be positive or negative. Okay. Now then you also notice that even though we originally, de originally dealt with radical equation, but somewhere in between, we see quadratic equation, which we solve by factoring. So uh, quadratic equation is not separate from radical equation. Okay? And factoring is a technique that we use in rational equation, okay, in rational equation, in radical equation, and you can see it basically being used everywhere. Okay. Now, the last part from this section, uh, you know what? Let me give you a break first. Right now is 9.16. We come back at 9.27. Okay, let's continue again. Uh, then I will go back to absolute value equation again. But this time, of course, we are not dealing with absolute equation we saw in algebra two. We will be dealing with this. In algebra two, we learn the following case, uh, cases. Uh, absolute of blah equals to C. If C is positive, then your next step will be either blah equals to C or blah equals to negative C, right? For example, if we have uh, absolute of blah equals to four, then your next step is blah equals to four or blah equals to negative four. Now, if C is zero, <clears throat> then blah must be zero. <clears throat> For example, uh, absolute of blah equals to zero. The only way absolute of blah equals to zero is when blah equals to zero. What happened if the C is negative, the constant on the other side is negative. So <clears throat> then no solution. In other words, for example, absolute of blah equals to negative four, then you can just cut it short right away saying no solution. Okay, now that's what we have learned uh, from Tuesday. But those are actually the material we learned from algebra two. Okay, and no, I will not ask you those kind of uh, question uh, anymore at least not that simple one. The one we are interested in dealing with are question like this, let's say absolute of uh, x plus three equals to, uh, let's say two x minus one. In other words, you have absolute value on one side and the other side, you have a variable. Okay, so it can be positive, can be negative. It can be positive, can be negative. Now, how do we do this problem? I will show you three different ways to do that. The first way is a standard way. That's how I learned it when I took my calculus one. Okay, uh, I think I said it wrong. Uh, I That's how I, yeah, that's right. That's how I learned it in calculus one. But when I saw that, the reason I remember that is because uh, when I did it in my pre-calculus class myself back in Indonesia, that's not how my pre-calculus instructors did. So when I did my calculus one, my instructor, uh, my professor did it that way. It was like, oh, that's a strange way of doing that. Okay, but he was trying to explain something, another idea. Okay, so... One method is the using this property, using the knowledge that absolute of blah being squared is always equals to the blah being squared without absolute value. Okay, now, so basically what he does is he will square both sides 
okay? So this becomes uh, x plus three squared equals to two x minus one squared. Okay, squaring both sides. Okay, but remember we said earlier, if you square both sides, then you may have extraneous solution, right? So if you do it this way, then you need to check your final answer against the original absolute value equation. Okay, now how to solve this? That's another, uh, that's another story, right? Okay, that's another story. But uh, let me say it this way that uh, when I apply square root property here, then I will suppose to get x plus three equals to plus minus two x minus one, is it right? You can foil that and then solve it by factoring. You can, you can do it that way. So, so if I want to write all possible solution for uh, for this question, there will be at least nine different ways, but some of them are actually similar to the other. So you can FOIL that this is x squared plus 6x plus 9 equals to 4x squared minus 4x plus 1, and then set one side equals to 0. You see what I mean? And then so on and so forth. But if you see that this is actually something squared equals to something squared, well, I can just apply square root property. Don't forget to put plus minus, okay? Such that, how do we solve this? Then I break it up. Either x plus three equals to two x minus one, or x plus three equals to negative of two x minus one. So x equals to four, that's the first possible solution. x plus three equals to negative two x plus one, so three x equals to negative two x2 equals to negative two over three. Okay, you will see that the third method, let me make it a second method later on, actually based on this work. Okay, but remember I square both sides earlier, right? I square both sides earlier, so I supposed to check. I'll check when x equals to four, what happened? Absolute of four plus three is it equals to two times four minus one. That's absolute of seven, which is seven. That's equals to seven. So let's check. How about when x equals to negative two thirds? absolute of negative two thirds plus three is it equals to two times negative two thirds minus one. That's absolute of something equals to negative, negative seven over third actually, but that's impossible. Absolute of something can never be negative. Okay, so we conclude, so the solution is X equals to four. <clears throat> okay. This is the work. Now, I purposely didn't use the blue route earlier here, the one I did here. I purposely didn't show you the, didn't go emphasize the blue route because uh, the following. Actually, to do this problem, you can also think the following. Absolute of blah equals to something implies blah equals that thing or blah equals to the opposite of that thing. Right? Do you notice that? I basically use I basically use this idea here. I basically use this idea here. What I did there, like from here jump to here right away, I basically use that idea. Okay, but the thing is, Thomas, the one here, you don't need to check. Why? But the thing is, uh, what you did here, you still need to check. Uh, you're right. That's because we knew earlier for this case, the other side is positive. Okay, now then on the case that we just did, on the case that we just did, 
uh, we can just assume plus minus first, like uh, blah equals two x minus one, and then blah equals to negative two x minus one, and then you check that later on. Okay, that leads to the second method, which saves us a much, much more time, much, 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 much more time. Okay, so the second method will be using the idea of So our second method, absolute of x plus three equals to absolute, I'm sorry, equals to two x minus one. We will use the idea of, we will use the idea of absolute of blah equals to C implies blah equals to C or blah equals to negative C if C is positive. So we need to check later on uh, the other side is possible or not. Okay, so my second method relies on that uh, principle. Okay, my second method relies on that principle. So once I see that, then I will say x plus three equals to two x minus one or x plus 3 equals to negative 2x minus 1. Okay, I solve this. So I get 4 equals to x. And then just like earlier, I get this is uh, negative 2 thirds, right? And then you check. Okay, what I check is, what I'm checking is is the other side may becomes positive. Okay, so I check, just say that check against the original equation. Okay, the way we did earlier in method one. Now, if you ask me out of these three methods that uh, I will show you the third one, out of these three methods, which method you like the most, Thomas? I prefer the second one. I prefer the second one. But uh, the third method worth mentioning because the second method cannot handle the following example later on. Okay, let's see the third method. The third method is based on this uh, knowledge, uh, based on this property. Absolute of x is equal to x for x non-negative. Absolute of blah is equals to blah if that blah is non-negative. Equals to negative blah for the blah is negative. Okay. In fact, this third method is the one commonly used once you are in calculus class. Okay. Especially advanced calculus. Now, if you are in math major or electrical engineering major, okay, uh, math major, electrical engineering major, for sure. I know some physics major uh, chose to take advanced calculus, which is a 300 or 400 level class. Then uh, there you will see more analysis why the work you did in your basic calculus uh, actually applies. Uh, so they basically look more detailed Okay, now based on this property, we do the following. Absolute of x plus three equals to two x minus one. Solution. For x plus three greater than zero, which means x is greater than negative three, then the guy inside the absolute value is positive then, right? Okay, positive or equals to zero, I should say. Now, because it's positive or zero, then I can just take off the absolute sign. And then solve. Do I need to check? A very little check. What kind of check? What kind of check? Just confirm that the x you get there satisfy this. 
is four greater than negative three. That's check. Okay, now what happened is x plus three is negative instead. Four, so the first case is this, this is the second case. For x plus three being negative, which means x is less than negative three, then negative of x plus three, right, is equals to two x minus one. Let's take a look. How do you get that negative in front of that guy comes? Remember, if the guy inside the house is negative, that when you take off the absolute value, you get negative this, right? So if the guy inside the house is negative, then when you get rid of the absolute sign, you need to apply that negative. Now then, that's assuming x is less than negative three, right? Assuming x is less than negative 3. And when I solve it, I get good bum, good boom. X is equal to negative 2 thirds. Now, the thing is, then when you check with the assumption, is x is less than negative 3? The answer is no, it's not x is not less than negative three. Okay. On the number line, negative two thirds is to the right of negative three, right? So negative two thirds is greater, not less than. Okay, now then, based on that, we summarize that, so, x equals to 4 only. Now, the strong point of this uh, method is you don't need to actually do the uh, big check. You just check, you just check against the assumption if x plus 3 is non-negative or x plus 3 is negative. In other words, the checking part is uh, the one easy, not, not as complicated as the other two. Okay. The other two here, uh, but Thomas, I don't think checking it this way is hard. Yeah, I know because you have integer here, but when you start having a negative and fraction, and you start have that uh, get a bit worried, right? Okay, not to say that if your X has radical, oh, that would be harder. Okay, so uh, no, not yet. Okay, uh, these have its own strong point. The third method has its own strong point. And uh, in my uh, quiz 2-3, as I remember, did I post that homework here? Quiz 2-3, you have quiz 1, do this weekend. Quiz 2-3, do next weekend, I think. But I wonder if I gave that problem. Let me see. We have that problem in quiz two, three. Yeah, I always ask that one though. I always ask that one, that type of question. And of course, students then complain, Thomas, that's not uh, uh, with what we go over. Uh, we did go over that. Uh, if you don't pay attention, of course, you won't see that. Uh, let's see. Oh, not yet. Okay, well, eventually you will see that. Yeah, eventually you will see that. Okay, eventually you will see that. Not yet. Okay. And then maybe quiz four. Then. Maybe quiz four. That will, I make it do next week also. Okay, not yet. Okay. Now then, uh, under what situation, Thomas? So you see, I went over example. Uh, the first method here is for the purpose of uh, the the analysis you will do in calculus especially advanced calculus, okay? The second method, basically the variation, the advanced notion from uh, the first method, okay? Which were more or less we borrow from the principle we did before here, okay? What we still need to check because it is based on the assumption that the 
the other side is positive or zero. Uh, positive. Okay, now the third method, uh, in some sense, did the checking earlier. So basically break it into cases right away. It breaks it into cases right away. Uh, if this, then what? If that, then what? Okay. Now, why I teach you the third method? If you, pre you Thomas, why you teach the third method? If you say that you prefer the second method, because there are some problems in pre-calculus and also calculus should be solved using that method. Like you look at that in cases. Now, the next example is the type of question you don't see anywhere in our textbook, but appear in the textbook we use at West LA College. In fact, I saw an instructor at Santa Monica College also use this problem in her test such that I decide, you know what, I can, if that instructor who, is, who was a full-time at uh, Santa Monica College use this question, even though it's not in the textbook, then I can use that also, <laughs> right? So before I knew there's a such question, but I didn't have the guts to ask that question uh, in Santa Monica pre-calculus test because, you know, it's a student may complain, right? Okay, but the, once another instructor used that, so, it's, so then I connect, we cannot consider this to be too hard to, too hard to do. Solve absolute of, let's say, x plus four minus absolute of, x minus two equals to, let's say five. Hmm. Or maybe make it three. Maybe make it three. Now I have students do it this way, a wrong way to do it, a so wrong way to do it. The students say, oh, Thomas, I look at that, I don't know what to do, but you know what? Let me just do it this way. X plus four minus X minus two equals to three. So I kind of ignore the absolute sign and then just go ahead with this. And then I get six equals to three. Oh, uh oh, uh oh, what happened? And then you say, ah, no solution. If your question can be done this simple, I would not ha have asked that in your test. Oh, no, this is a wrong way to do it. Okay, this is a wrong way to do it. Now, I want to show you a proper way to do it, but it has the following situation, okay? It has the following situation. I need to see on the number line, what are the critical numbers? Critical numbers, maybe I write it down critical numbers. Okay. X plus four equals to zero when X equals to negative four. X minus two equals to zero when X is two. Now those are my critical numbers. Okay, so what happened is then on the number line, Two and negative four are the places where it may change. It may change the sign. Now, then from this place, we have three cases instead of only two. The first case, let me mark it in yellow, is the case where X is greater equals to two. The second case, I mark it in blue, is the case where X is less than two, but at least negative four. The last case is the one less than negative four. We have three cases now based on the interval where 
the x plus 4 may be positive, may be negative, x plus 2, x minus 2 may be positive, may be negative. So case number one, case one, where x is greater or equals to 2. Now, if x is greater or equals to 2, what happened to x plus 4? It must be greater or equals to 6, is it right? But x plus 4 greater or equals to 6 implies x plus 4 must be non-negative. Agree? Therefore, absolute of x plus 4 will be treated as x plus 4. On the other hand, when x is greater or equals to 2, then x minus 2 will be greater or equals to 0. Therefore, absolute of x minus 2 will be treated as x minus 2. Now, that's the setup for the first case. The, yellow part. Now with that then, absolute of x plus 4 minus absolute of x minus 2 equals to 3 implies, in this x greater equals to uh, 2, implies we have this equation. Notice that I replaced the absolute value by just parentheses. Based on this assumption that x is greater or equal to 2, then both this guy and this guy be positive or 0. And because they are positive or 0, then I can just get rid of the absolute sign. Simplify, I get 6 equals to 3, which is a contradiction. So no solution from this case. Let's see the second case, case two, where the x is between negative four and two. So if I add four, This will be greater or equals to zero, right? If I add four, let me write it here and add four. So in case two, absolute of x plus four will become still just x plus four. However, what happened to x minus two? That would be between negative 6 and 0, but less than 0. Okay. In other words, in this interval, absolute of x minus 2 will be considered the opposite of x minus 2. Therefore, in this interval, that equation translates to be x plus 4 plus x minus 2. So 2x plus 2 equals to 3. 2x equals to 1. x equals to 1 half. Okay, now, of course, you check is one half is one half is x equals to one half in that interval because the assumption for case two is x has to be between negative one uh, negative four to two right now the thing is is this guy in that interval is one half in this interval. Uh, one half is here, right? This is one half. So now you see that you have a solution. One half will make it. You see that? 
one half will make it. So we have one solution right now. Okay. Uh, in other words, you basically check it against, you check it against the uh, hypothesis that X is in that interval. Okay. That's for case two. Now we go to case three, just in case we have multiple solution. Case three, that's the case when X is less than negative four, which means X plus four is less than zero, which means absolute of X plus, actually X plus four. Absolute of X plus four will be the opposite Likewise, x minus 2 will be less than negative 6, which implies x minus 2 is negative. Absolute of x minus 2 becomes the opposite of x minus 2. With that case, then this equation in that interval translates to be negative of x plus 4 plus x minus 2 equals to 3, negative 6 equals to 3, which is a contradiction. So from these three cases, the solution is x equals to 1 half. Now, in addition to that, uh, in my lecture, I already went over number, in my lecture, uh, number 43, and I think number 42 or 44, I don't remember, maybe number 44. Okay, uh, so you should try question number 43 also, but it's more into philosophical question. Okay, so I'm done with this 1.4. You see that 1.4 is a long section, huh? Uh, can I explain x minus 2 less than negative 6? Oh, from here. From here. We start with the assumption that x is less than negative 4. Right? So when you subtract by 2, when you subtract by 2, then you subtract by 2, this becomes x minus 2, subtract by 2, this becomes negative 6. Okay, now then, now once this expression is less than negative six, then guaranteed it must be less than zero. It's even, it's even less than negative six, so it must be less than zero. But why we care about that x minus two, Thomas, just in case you have that question, because in our equation, we have this expression. And I want to get rid of the absolute value, so I need to know what is the sign of that x minus two? Just like we earlier here, we want to know what is the sign of that x plus four, okay? Now, I don't think this question is hard to understand, but it is tedious, okay? So if you have question here, you are normal, uh, but it's not on the hard side, it's more into the tedious side. Why is it tedious? Because we need to look at that from three different cases. We need to look at that from three different cases. When is it he when it is here, what's the solution? No solution. When it is here, do we have solution? Yes, we have solution. Is it in this interval? Yes, it is in this interval. So yes, we have that one solution. Then in this case here, do we have solution? No solution. It is possible, it is possible. From the one here, you get a solution but it turns out that the X is not that interval. Let's say you get X equals to negative four, right? But in this interval, X supposed to be greater or equals to two. So if you get X equals to negative four in this interval, you have to cancel it. Okay. <clears throat> now I will stop here for 1.4. I have only approximately 20 minutes left for my 1.6. Okay, 1.6 consists of four parts, okay, inequality.
okay and there's a chance that i don't have a chance to do this number 31 uh, so the person who asked me this number 31 you may want to watch lesson five i believe i covered that in lesson five okay even though i somehow think i did similar question in lesson four also yeah. okay now inequalities that's because i spent like around half an hour earlier uh, to show you the new plan you know but don't worry then we, we will have enough time we'll have enough time okay uh now inequalities the first one is linear inequalities that's easy the second one is absolute value inequality And then we have polynomial inequality. And we have rational inequalities. We have, we will cover the first two. Okay, we'll cover the first two. Uh, for the person who asked me number 31 on Tuesday next week, uh, ask me this question again, okay? Yeah, if you uh, look at my uh, lesson five and you still don't get it, then you ask me again. Okay, now, to solve linear inequalities, to solve linear inequalities, maybe I should say solving linear inequalities, is very similar Solving linear inequalities is very similar to solving linear equation. Yeah, let me show you the similarity first. Okay, so if we have 3x plus 5. Uh, let's say less than seven, the way we solve that, you can see that inequality sign as if that's equal sign. Okay. In other words, the work will be exactly the same if you change that inequality sign to equal sign. Okay. Now, what is the difference? The difference is, so out of similarities, there are some difference. The difference is, when we multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, then we need to reverse the inequality sign at the same time. And notice that I write that at the same time in capital because I emphasize that. Okay, for example, for example, suppose I have negative 3x plus 5 less than 7. Subtract by 5. Now, but once I divide by negative 3, I need to reverse the inequality sign at the same time. Okay, notice what happened. This inequality sign here being reversed. At the same time, you divide by negative 3. Now, this is where I told you in the past that I don't like people doing pancake, right? Because they don't realize they make mistake here. When they do pancake, they subtract by five here, subtract by five here, they get negative three X is less than two. So far it's still okay though. And then they divide by negative three. That's where you make mistake. They may write it this way, but you already make mistake here. In fact, you do two mistakes. 
you do two mistakes. Mistakes. Baba. Baba. Yeah, my daughter is next to me. Okay. The first mistake, one of the principle. Okay. The next step, which is dividing by negative three, should be done in the next line. Not on the same line when you add that, you subtract by that five. The second mistake is you divide by negative three, but you didn't reverse the inequality sign. When dividing by negative three, we need to reverse the inequality sign at the same time. Now, of course, I still have students. The reason I emphasize this is because I have students try to argue with me, but Thomas, I get the right answer. I don't know what happened. Yeah, uh, what happened? Somebody say, I don't know what happened. What happened? Sorry, I accidentally exited Zoom and when I came back in, it was unmuted. I'm sorry. Okay, now, uh, some students argue with me, but Thomas, I get the right answer. Uh, no, the work is wrong. Okay, so your final answer may be right, but your work is wrong. What's wrong with that? Let's see, let's see what's wrong with that. According to your final answer, X has to be greater, equal, uh, greater to than uh, negative two thirds, right? So in other words, X equals to zero should be the answer, right? X equals to zero is a solution, agree? That's what you say. But the thing is, X equals to zero is a solution to your final answer, but not the solution for this. You don't believe me? Try it. Negative three times zero over negative three. Is it less than negative two thirds? No, it's not. In other words, this statement here is not equivalent to the statement here because it gives you different solution. But Thomas, you know what I mean? Well, no, I don't know what you mean from what you write. I think I know what you mean from what you write, but you write it wrong still. When I grade you, I have to grade you based on what you write, not based on what I think you write. The definition of bias the definition of bias is exactly that, that I think of you based on my perception that I already have on you, not based on what you actually say. That's bias. Hey, a lot of people hate politics, right? I'm one of them. Why? Because one person say it this way, it's okay, but the other person say exactly the same thing, that's not okay. That's bias. But you know, but you know, Thomas, you know what he meant. Well, doesn't matter what he meant. If he say it right, then it is right. If he say it wrong, it's wrong. You cannot say, judge it because, especially because you you say that. Well, you know that person. The thing is, you don't know them. You don't know them. You don't know what kind of scandals they have behind. Okay, and you don't know me. <laughs> That's the thing. Therefore. When I grade you, I don't know you. I have to judge you based on what you write, okay? So coming back, it's not about politics though, but I want to say that politics becomes so nasty because of that unfairness that we judge people based on our perception instead of based on what that person say or that person does, okay? So I don't want that thing in my class. Therefore, remember, when I grade you, I grade you based on what you write, not based on what I think you write. Keep it clear. Now that's for uh, linear, in linear equation. Now, in our textbook, it starts right away with a compound linear equation. Like number eight is the standard one. I don't even want to go over that. Number 10. 
what happens if we have these terms? Negative 2 is less than 4x plus 1 over 3 less than equals to zero. Just solve it as usual. Multiply both sides, all sides by three. And three is a positive number, so I don't need to change the inequality sign. Subtract by one. Divide it by four. So the solution, in my class, the solution, unless otherwise stated, unless otherwise directed, your solution should be in interval notation. Okay, your solution should be in interval notation. Now, the type of question you don't see in your textbook the type of question you don't see in your textbook is something look like this. What happened if, for example, we cannot isolate that compound inequality. We cannot isolate the variable in that compound inequality. It's like whatever you do here, you. Uh, Subtract one divided by three, you will have some x in the other two sides. Now you can try. Let's say, let's say I subtract by one. Don't write this down. If I subtract by one divided by three, I still have x actually on all both all sides. Right? So I cannot really isolate that. Now, in this situation, what do we do? Well, well, we go back to what that compound inequality means. This inequality means, first, this has to be true. Okay, so first, x minus 3 is less than 3x plus 1. Second, this has to be true. And at the same time, 3x plus 1 is less than 17 minus x. Okay, so the key is that these two inequality must be true. Okay, now I will so uh, solve each one of them. So I will get x is greater than negative 2. Okay, you solve it yourself. Okay, and then here I will get x is less than 4. Okay, you show your work, of course. Now then, because in between, we need to satisfy both, it's an n. x has to be greater than 2 and at the same time, less than four, when you put them together, then X is greater than negative two, yet less than four. Okay, so the solution is between negative two to four. <clears throat> okay, now for absolute value, absolute value, inequality it is based on these two our textbook i think called it the theorem but it's basically like this if c is a positive number then absolute of blah less than c implies that blah is between negative c and c Why? Because the distance of that blah from zero is less than C units from zero. Okay, so that's the explanation pictorially from here. We see then that blah must be uh, 
uh, to the right of negative c but to the left of c therefore we say that on the other hand what happened if absolute of blah is greater than c it seems like it uh, it is very similar to restraining order right you cannot you you cannot uh, you have to be more than how many feet from who or from where okay so pictorially your distance from zero has to be more than c units so it's either to the right of that c or to the left of that negative c If you can imagine that picture, then we come up to this conclusion. So if absolute of blah is greater than a positive number, then that blah must be to the left of negative of that number, or that blah is to the right of C. Number 20. Two absolute negative 11 minus 7x minus two greater than 10. Isolate the absolute value. So you see, this is the second case. The distance has to be more than six. Then when I break it up, when I split it, then either that guy inside the absolute value is to the left of negative six or to the right of positive six. Then from there, you solve it further. Now the one on the right hand side, I also solve it further. I will get negative 7x is greater than 17. X is therefore less than. Remember, I divide by negative 7, right? Less than negative 17 over 7. Okay, so the solution will be either x is to the left of negative 17 over 7 or to the right of 5 over 7 in interval notation. Now, if you have hard time to find out uh, what's the interval notation, you may want to sketch that first. On the number line, the negative five over seven, and you want the one to the right of that, right? And negative 17 over seven, you want the one to the left of that. Hopefully, by sketching that graph, uh, visualizing that, you can get this uh, interval faster. Okay. Uh, and the absolute value equation, the basic one is basically just that. So if you take a look in your textbook, there are only a few problems we can do right now. Okay, I think uh, you can do only number seven, number nine, number 17, number 19. Okay, what happened if the other side is negative? Then you start think a little bit, but it won't be too hard. Number 21, number 23, and number 25. But I will go over this on Tuesday. Okay, I will go over this, especially 21, 23, 25 on Tuesday before I do the uh, polynomial and quadratic one, okay? Uh, the principle is remember that absolute of something is always at least zero. That's one very strong property, very important property, okay? In other words, so if the question is, if the question is absolute of blah is greater equals to negative two, well, it's always positive anyway, 
right? This guy is always greater or equal to zero anyway. So it must be always greater or equal to negative two. Always true, right? Okay. Now, if you see that situation, doesn't matter what, what you have on the absolute value. Okay. Then you will say the solution will be all real numbers, which we usually express as negative infinity to infinity. On the other hand, what if we reverse that? Uh, what if we have absolute of blah is less than equals to negative true? But we know absolute of blah is always positive, cannot be negative. Under no condition, it will be negative. Right? So we will go ahead and say this is no solution. It's actually that simple. Okay, but uh, some thinking required though. Now, the bigger issue is what happened if you have the other side is zero. So absolute of blah greater than zero. It is always true, except then it is not equal to zero. Then from there you solve further. What happened if you have absolute of blah less than equals to zero. Well, we know it, no, it can never be negative, but it may be zero. And then you solve further like that. Okay. Uh, this is where I will stop for my lesson, uh, what lesson four, the problems from our textbook regarding lesson four. Uh, on, on Monday, I will do problems in regards uh, related to this lesson four from my old test. Okay, so very likely on Monday, I will uh, pick problems from my old test uh, has something to do with equation. Okay. Uh, maybe some easy inequality, but not uh, the hard one. Okay, on their Wednesday, then I will do uh, inequality, including polynomial one. Okay, so uh, on Monday, uh, you, you can join their, the, the discussion on Monday, you can, but if you don't have time to join the discussion or you decide not to do so, uh, remember that you have the recording for you to look back, okay? This is where I will stop. See you then on Tuesday next week. Thank you, Tuesday.